This is part two of our bicycle saddle instruction video. In this video, we will be focusing on constructing the seat portion itself and we'll leave the mounting rails for a later video. The seat is constructed as a boundary that has some special features. You're going to purposely construct more boundary than we need that's going to go past our mirror plane located on the front plane. This technique is going to allow us to control the shape of the boundary where it meets the front plane at the guide curve that's located on the front plane. In doing so, we'll be able to make a smooth blend with the other half of the boundary when we mirror it. Once we've constructed the boundary, we're going to actually remove that excess piece so that it's now cut off at the mirror plane. We can then mirror it, and then we will shell it. And then we will finish the seat by adding some fillets. I will now roll the model back to step one, which is our first layout sketch. In order to construct this layout sketch, you want to have your seat front guideline image visible. This will help you design a seat that is close to the size and shape of industry standards. This sketch has been set partially transparent in your starter file. So editing the sketch, the layout itself, will zoom in on some of the details. The upper curve is done as a spline. It goes all the way to the right plane. all the way to whatever distance I want the tail to be at. In my case, I'm making a pointed tail seat, so I'm going to make my seat about 300 millimeters long. If you make a triangular tailed seat, it'll be about 275 millimeters long. This is a single curve that I've drawn from nose to tail. And what I've done is I've made sure that I'm not coming to a sharp point at the end. I'm going to leave a little bit of a flat of about two millimeters tall. This will prevent us from having a degenerate point at either end of our seat, which will help us when we're trying to shell it. I've also made sure that this curve doesn't quite go vertical where it meets this vertical line. I've put a five degree angle here and about a 10 degree angle here. You can experiment with what will work for you, but if you try to make this curve go straight vertical where it meets this profile plane, it's possible that the boundary will fail. The lower curve of the seat meets the bottom of this little flat section here, and it also is a continuous spline going from nose to tail. The low end of the seat is a little bit forward, of the high point, and the high point is typically where your pelvic sit bones will rest. That's about 215, or in this case, 225 millimeters from the nose of the seat. The seat I'm making is a racing style seat. If you're going to make a more comfortable sort of seat, you might actually make this vertical height of the seat taller. You also notice that my sketch drops about nine millimeters from the high point to where the nose starts curving down to the very tip. Now we'll take a look at the top layout of our seat. And I'll make my top guideline image visible. So again we see here at the nose of the seat I made a little two millimeter wide flat zone which the outer contour of the seat meets up with. And once again I've made sure that the contour here doesn't quite go perfectly vertical where it meets this flat area. I put in about a three degree angle. Again, experiment with that yourself to see what works. Here's my wide point of the seat, which is pretty much in a line with where the sit bones rest. And then at the tail of the seat, once again, I have a two millimeter wide zone and I've made sure that the contour doesn't quite go vertical where it hits this point. I've put a three degree angle on the spline handle. 
The width of my seed is about 140 millimeters, going from here to the center line to the outside theoretical mirror image. And at this crossing over point, I have 66 millimeters wide. You can go a little narrower. Your nose might be as narrow as 40 millimeters. But there should be a gentle arc going from here to this transition point before it starts getting wide again. Once again, this is a single spline from nose to tail. So closing that sketch and hiding my guideline sketches, I'm left with my front view layout and my top view layout. And I have two additional layouts which are going to be for the mounting rails that go underneath the seat. For this video I'm going to skip over those and we'll come back to that in the next video. Rolling my feature tree down, I come to step five. Steps one and two were the first two layouts and we've skipped over steps three and four. Step five is a plane that's going to be parallel to the front plane and offset a certain distance to give us that extra chunk of boundary that we're going to make. The distance is not actually important, but I typically use about 10 millimeters. The next step is to make a sketch. It's going to locate all of our planes for the boundary. Because we have a shape that changes quite a bit in quite a few different areas. Instead of having evenly spaced planes like we've done on some projects, it sometimes makes more sense to put a plane where something critical is occurring. So here I've put a line where this spline is transitioning from this curvy section to this flat section. I later on put another line here because I realized that I wasn't getting the boundary shape that I quite wanted and needed another profile here. Put a line here right where the lowest part of the seat is. Put another line where the highest point is. And then I've added some additional lines here and here because I found that I needed some additional profiles back here in order to make the boundary not collapse as it was being formed from the nose to the tail. The last line is where the actual tail is. So the last plane for profiles will be at the tail. The first plane for the profiles will actually be the right plane. I'll close this sketch and now show how the planes are actually constructed. Each plane is going to be parallel to the right plane and passing through one of these sketch points that represents the actual plane location. You can use the upper sketch point of these vertical lines or the lower sketch point. It doesn't matter because they are vertical. So here, for example, is the plane for profile two, parallel to the right plane and passing through this point. You need to do this for every single plane. In my case, I've got eight profiles. So I've got eight planes first plane once again being the right plane located over here. Let me just make these planes visible for a moment. Now continuing to roll the model forward, I'm going to take a look at how the seat boundary is actually constructed. I'm actually going to delete the seat boundary for this video and then reconstruct it so you can see what the process is. First steps, as always, are to make our guide curves. Rolling back to our first guide curve, what I always like to do is start out with my projected curves. Doesn't matter which order you do them in. But here what I've done is made a copy of the top view of the outer guide and a copy of this bottom line in the front view. I've then projected those two sketches together to get this blue curve that will represent the bottom outer edge of the seat. The next step is to make a guide of the top of the seat that rests on the front plane. Here's our front plane and this is our excess material plane. 
the next step is to make a copy of the same top guide, but not on the front plane, but this time on that excess material plane. So here we see the same guide copied twice onto two different planes. Continuing on, we'll make a copy of the bottom contour of the seat onto our front plane. And once again, we're going to copy that a second time onto our excess material plane. So these two copies come from our front layout and these two copies come from our front layout. Now we have a total of five guide curves, four that are resting in flat planes and the one that was made as a projected curve. Now that we have our guide curves, we can go and draw all of our profiles. Starting with profile one, I need to draw a shape that's going to pass through all five guide curves. This is the guide curve sitting on the front plane, and this is a guide curve sitting on that excess material plane. What I really care about is this portion here, and then this is the excess material here. So just deleting these for a moment, what I want to do, as usual, is draw a curve going from my upper guide to my outer guide, and then a flat line going from my outer guide to the bottom guide. In all cases, we will use the Pierce relation. And what's important is that this spline has to be horizontal where it meets this upper guide curve. Then we need to add the excess material that's going to pass through this guide curve and this guide curve. So I'm going to purposely draw these lines a little bit off angle because I don't want any relations added to it. I'm going to now hold my control key down, click on this corner, and on this guide curve that sits on that excess material plane, make a pierce, click on this one here and this one here, and make a pierce. And what we will find is that even though this line and this line are separate, they are automatically going to be in line with each other, and they will be horizontal. But it's best not to actually have a horizontal relation on these if you can help it, and just let the pierce relations take care of the position of this line. Similarly, it's probably best not to have a vertical relation on this line. Doing so will sometimes cause us to have an overdefined situation. You'll see some of your lines become yellow. If you have an error trying to put a horizontal relation on this control handle for the spline, instead of putting a relation on that handle, you can always make a tangent relation between the spline and this line here, which will be horizontal, even if it doesn't have that relation on it. As a result, this handle then will become horizontal. So every profile is going to look like this. It will have one spline and one, two, three, four straight lines. There has to be a total of five pierces going on in this sketch, one for every guide curve. When you're making these pierce relations, it's always a good idea to hide your original layouts so that your pierces will be made to the guide curves instead of to the layouts. So you see now when I hid those, some of my guide curves disappeared. So it's possible that I made my pierce relations to the layouts rather than the actual guide curves. Usually that's not a big deal, but I prefer to always make sure that the pierce relations go to the guide curves that were copied from the layouts and not to the layouts themselves. Finishing the sketch, I'll show you what all of the profiles look like. You see that they all are just variations on the same theme that I did on my first profile. Continuing on to the back, we see that what I did was made some of my plane space very closely, and that's because I was finding as I made my boundary that this portion here wanted to sort of collapse, so I had to add some additional profiles that helped hold the shape out. So when you're making your seat, what you might want to do is start with fewer planes and fewer profiles and then add more as necessary. So now we've done all the hard work 
All we have to do is make the actual boundary. For direction one, I will choose my profiles. And I'll try to pick all of them up near this upper corner so that it won't accidentally twist on me. Like that. So if it does twist, just drag the point over to realign it. Now I'll select direction two. It's easier often to select the guides off of the feature tree. I've got five guides here that I need to choose, so I'll just choose them in order. Remember, you've got five guides. It's very common for people to make their guide curves and then forget to actually use them in the boundary creation. Let me hide the curvature cone so we can just see this a little more clearly. Now at each guide curve and each profile, we have the ability to control the outside surface shape of the boundary where it passes through the plane that a guide curve or a profile is located in. In our case, we want to control the shape of the upper surface and the lower surface where it passes through our mirror plane, which is the front plane. We're going to make sure that this surface at this guide curve, for example, is going to be going normal or at right angles to the plane that the guide curve is sitting in. In order to do this, we have to select the particular guide curve. We can move these little flags around to see the different ones if we have to. I'm going to look for this flag here that's pointing to this guide curve on the upper surface. I'm going to change this option from none to normal to profile. That's going to adjust this upper surface where it passes through this guide curve and make sure that it's going at right angles or normal to the plane that this profile is or this guide curve is sitting in. Now I can select that option by doing it in this flag here or I can do it here in the main menu. And we can see now that because I've changed that here, it's put the word normal on that particular guide curve. I want to also do it for the guide curve that's sitting on the bottom here and is also sitting on the mirror plane. So that's this guide curve here. I'm having a little trouble seeing which well, I accidentally deselected that. I'll reselect that one. Now I can see the flag for that. I'm going to change that to normal to profile. And that will make sure that this surface down here, when it's passing through the guide curve, will be going normal to the guide curve's plane. We could also do that to the guide curves that represent the excess material sitting out here and here, but I don't think that's really necessary. So I'll just go ahead and finish this creation, which gives me my one half of a boundary with this extra material on it. And now I'm going to cut off that extra material, but I can do that without a sketch. I can actually use my front plane as a cutting surface to remove this excess material. And I'm going to use the front plane because that's also my mirror plane. So I'm going to use insert cut with surface, and I'm going to select my front plane when I do that, I get a little arrow indicating the direction of, that the material will be cut away in. So I want this arrow to be facing away in this direction, and that's going to get rid of this excess material. Now I can use the front plane to make a mirror of this entire body, and make sure you use the bodies option, not the features option. And that gives me my entire seat. If I've done this correctly, I should be able to turn on zebra stripes. 
can see these stripes going smoothly through the join at the front plane. We also can see that we have a tiny flat on the nose and a similar one on the tail. If I go back and edit this boundary, and I change that one guide curve that had normal to profile on it, and remove that, and just change that to none, I should find now that when I exit that feature, that these two halves are not quite blending together smoothly. We can see that little jog in our zebra stripes. So we want to make sure that we've selected that option on the guide curves that are located on that mirror plane to make sure that this blends together properly. The next step now is just to make this a shell. Going into our features, select our shell. We want to make a shell thickness of about three millimeters. So select this surface and this surface. And we've had a successful shell. You might get a warning telling you that it can't make the shell because there's some feature somewhere which has a radius smaller than the shell thickness. In that case, you could try reducing the shell thickness a little bit or searching for where maybe you have a radius that is tighter than the shell thickness. And that probably is going to happen at the nose or the tail. If that does occur, play around with how much of a flat you have on the end and what angle these curves meet at this flat. You might have to relax that angle a little bit more. Now you might find this flat to be a little objectionable, but what we're going to do to make it look a little better is just add a small fillet to this edge. You'll only be able to fit about a three or four millimeter fillet in there. That sort of blends this flat back into this surface here. Try to get as big a fillet in as you can. I can get all the way up to six millimeters. Do that both at the nose and the tail. That can probably be both in the same feature. And go ahead and do that on the inside as well. Now that you have these fillets that are blending these straight portions to the curved portions, you can easily add a fillet along the outside and inside edge. I think you can only make these about one millimeter. And because of this blend here and with tangent propagation selected, we should have this edge automatically go around the perimeter. So here we see it's automatically highlighted the entire perimeter edge because of this option and we just finish our fillet. We've got a completed seat that's been shelled and also has these nice refining fillets along the edges. This concludes our part two video and in part three we will build the rails that sit on the bottom.